to, and then, and then. Good morning, everybody. So uh, just so we all know, if you have, um, the, the pace can be as long as you have questions. If you have a question, just go ahead and message them uh, on the Zoom call. That way I can see them and then I'll address them as they pop up. But this is a very laid back um, atmosphere, so to speak. And it's, I, I try and make it a little bit fun because it's kind of boring, but we're gonna cover as much as we can today. I think we have an hour to get this knocked out, but some of the screens I won't go into and some of them I'll be a little more uh, detailed on as they're more important than the others. But uh, if nobody has any questions as of yet, we'll just start chucking through this and uh, get to the very end. But thanks for joining me. And uh, if you ever have any questions in regards to this stuff, I'm up at 5.30 every day. And I usually don't hit the rack until about 10 or 10.30. So call, text, or email uh, any, any questions you have, and I'll make sure I get them addressed ASAP. And there's my information. There's my cell phone number. <clears throat> Excuse me. My email address. My office is actually just right down the road from here. Um, and then at the very bottom is uh, my email address. Uh, can they see that? Um, yes. Yep. Yeah, we see it. Okay, awesome. And then just a little bit about myself. I've been in mortgage lending since 1996. My, my, my favorite customers to this day, uh, although, they, although they take more work, are first-time home buyers. I like it when people show up at closings and they start crying. Uh, it's just, it still makes it fun for me. I still enjoy what I do. Um, my background is, you know, I've been in business since 1996. I'm, a, I'm an Army veteran. I'm type A. I'm OCD. I'm a little neurotic, but that actually works out in my favor because I'm very detail-oriented. And that, uh, that works on the lending side and hasn't failed me yet. So we always make sure out of 143 closings last year and 31 this year, we didn't miss one closing date. So we make sure everything is buttoned up pretty tight. And uh, once, we, once the pre-approval or the pre-call letter goes out, uh, there's no looking back. We get it to the finish line with no issues. So there's a couple um, approaches that I have with clients. Um, some are first time home buyers, they like to have their hands held and they need it. Uh, my goal is to always make sure that my first time home buyers, if they have any questions, they're addressed immediately. And if we're doing our job correctly, they won't have any questions at all. We have it, we have it down to a science. We have a template that we go by in regards to what they're going to need to know, um, what we're going to need from them and then next steps. So like, for example, you don't have to do anything. I'll give you all the information you need. And if you're not ready, that's fine. That's more of a someone who's, this is their third or fourth home. I'm a low pressure guy. There's no sale ending at midnight. I give them all the information they need to make an educated decision and they take it from there. And then, you know, number two is you think you're ready to buy, but you think you can navigate the home buying process on your own. I'm not seeing that as much now uh, due to the inventory. I've had many clients that still offer below list and they're still looking for homes, but I just kind of, I have a hands-off approach and say, guess what? I'm here. If you need me, just let me know. And then the ones that we spend some time together and we are past the pre-approval, the pre-qualification phase. Um, I, I want them to have the confidence to buy a home now if they'd like. And if they want me to guide them through the process, I'm here. I think you can just say, you know, yep. um, this camera is where people are seeing you. Okay. Are you making your landlord rich? So as we all know, Right now, rent is rates have gone up probably 1% in the past six months, but so is rent. So a lot of people, they're hesitant about buying a home, but when I do the breakdown for them, I do a cost analysis in regards to, you know, when people find out, hey, I've been renting an apartment for five years and I like it here and my landlord's nice and he fixes everything when I need it fixed. But when they look at what they've spent in the past five years, and they didn't even realize they actually could be could have been approved five years ago or even three years ago. So what I try and do is I do a cost comparison. Here's what you're paying in rent. Here's what you're paying in your mortgage based on whatever, a $200,000, $250,000 home. And a lot of times that's really an eye opener in regards to what they will qualify for. They, a lot of people don't even realize they can write off their mortgage interest at the end of the year on the tax returns. And obviously as a renter, you get nothing back in return. So that's something that I've done a lot lately because people are starting to get savvy or, you know, I, I think the, uh, 
25% is the national average in, in, regard, in regards to what rent is going up uh, this year. And that's quite a bit. That's a big jump in, in one chunk. So if you have any clients that are renting and they want a cost analysis done by me, then just do an email introduction, a text introduction, or just give them my name and number. And I can call them and I'll, I'll break down the numbers and they can make an educated decision from there. But right now is definitely inventory is, you know, a low as we know, but it's better to have them, hey, if their lease is up in August, get them pre-approved right now. That way, when they're ready to pull the trigger, we're all, we're all set and ready to go. So some of this stuff is <clears throat> going to be up to date. <clears throat> the rates on these charts are going to be a little off because rates have gone up and I haven't done, I haven't had this new proposal done with rates going up. But rates going up in comparison to the rent going up, it's still very similar. So <clears throat> the national average for a three-bedroom apartment, 1,298 square feet, is $1,600 a month. A three-bedroom house is roughly $1,546 a month at 1,800 square feet. So, for example, this is an FHA loan. Sales price is $275. Mortgage term is 30 years. That rate is going to be closer to 4% now. Uh, and then the down payment with FHA is three and a half percent. But a lot of times, you know, it used to be back in the day, the seller was willing to, to contribute to some of the closing costs on FHA or conventional loans. And, and that ship has kind of sailed uh, due to the market. But this is just letting them see, hey, you could own this house and versus what you're paying in rent in your apartment. So it's kind of a, like I said, it's an eye opener for them to see. <clears throat> And that's generally what the closing cost would be. Closing costs of the origination fee, which would be to my bank and then the title, title company or the title insurance, the closing, the doc, the doc prep, tax stamp, deed prep, all of it. So that's just a rough estimate. And then this is a breakdown. <clears throat> year one through year 10, annual rent, as you can see, it keeps going up. Annual payment, federal, I won't get too deep into this, um, Federal tax savings in regards to mortgage interest, in regards to the write-off, estimated value. You see how that value goes up each year. Certain parts of the country are different as far as appreciation, um, but your loan balance as you go down after year one to year 10. Uh, mortgages now, no mortgage on this planet has a prepayment penalty. So if you have a client, whether they have a bonus or they have an inheritance or whatever, if they want to apply additional funds outside of the regular scheduled monthly payment, that money can be applied directly toward principal and they don't have to have any interest applied to it. And basically it knocks down the principal of whatever amount they prepay. So there are no prepayment penalties left on the earth. Unless it's a hard money lender, which I don't, uh, I don't have any hard money lenders, uh, but they definitely have prepayment penalties because uh, it's their funds and they can pretty much uh, set the tone for what they're going to lend at, but we don't have any of these products. And then estimated equity in regards to the property, one to one to 10. And that's the same scenario we were talking about. FHA sales price, 275, 30 year uh, down payment and closing cost. Are you ready to be a homeowner? Do you have your ducks in a row? Too many times, and a lot of you agents will know, people, they, they see a home come up online and it's their dream home and they have to have it. Unfortunately, now in today's market, listing agents won't even show the property unless they're pre-approved or pre-qualified. So that's where the type A ex-military OCD comes in with me. I want to make sure that if we send over an offer and it's accepted, we, we, my name will never be associated with a mortgage that didn't close on time. So it's very important as the lender, I, I'm going to say, I need this, I need this, I need this. And if they don't have that, then I'm not going to issue the pre-qualified pre-qualification letter, you know, if they're like, I need your tax returns for two years, well, here's my paycheck and stuff. That doesn't work. <clears throat> so I'm good at nudging them along and my assistant, Aaron, is really good at that. So we want to make sure that we have everything we need from them for them to make an offer and, and have a horse in the race. Some people are very organized. Some are scatterbrained. So they, they, they really kind of provide the bare minimum, but we make sure that they uh, have everything they need. <clears throat> so as a lender, we look at the, the most important thing is the credit score. That, that shows us your ability to repay the mortgage that we could possibly grant you. So um, we have, there's a lot of clients who I will talk to them and I'll say, well, how's your credit score? And they're like, probably not good. And then some people are very hesitant about having the credit run. Unfortunately for me as a lender, the difference between a 660 credit score and a 720 credit score 
sometimes can be a quarter of a point. So when they say, you know, it's good, average, fair, I always ask them, look, I'm going to run your credit one time. It's good for 120 days. And I've had people that say their credit's excellent and it'd be a 620 because they look at Credit Karma and they're saying my score on Credit Karma is 720. Credit Karma is always higher than what we actually pull because their algorithm is different in regards to their scores. They don't lend money. They are a scoring tool model company. Um, so if someone says my credit karma is 720, generally I'll take 30 points off that. And when I run the, the credit reports on the three major bureaus, it's always lower. But I've also had some clients that they tell me their credit is bad and I run their credit and it's like a 750 credit score. And I say, why, why would you think your credit's bad? Well, my payment's due on the first and I usually make it on the ninth. That's not bad. The only thing that can affect your credit score in a negative manner are these things. One, uh, lates go by 30, 60, 90, and 120. So as the needle keeps going this way, as far as the lates, the, the bigger the late, like 90 or 120, usually when, it, when it, an account goes to 120, it's already being sent to judgment collections. So if someone is 60 days past due, the worst part is when you have somebody that has a Kohl's credit card with a $500 credit limit with a $20 payment and they skip the payment for three months, they just forgot to pay it. That's just as bad as going late on a car payment. If it shows up 60 or 90 days past due, that can devastate the credit score in a very short time. Um, what I do is when I talk to someone, I'm not like your typical bank. If I look at someone's credit score, I always say, you know, my grandma used to say, grow old with me, the best is yet to be, just give me a path. And if someone, people have credit scores that are challenged for different reasons, whether it be a divorce, uh, uh, the loss of a spouse, the loss of a job, um, I look at the credit score and the credit tells a story. So if someone's had perfect credit up until two years ago, and all of a sudden there's lates, lates, lates. And I say, what happened, you know, in, in 2019, well, I lost my job. So we have a company that I work with. It's called 360 credit consulting. I don't do credit repair, but I do a handoff to them. And there's a fee that they charge monthly, uh, to get them reestablished on the credit side. And I, once I do the handoff, I'll get an alert whether it be two, three, seven months later, they'll say, hey, Mr. Jones is ready to go. We just ran his credit and he's back in the game. That way, then I, then I would do the handoff back to you and say, Mr. Jones is good. Um, what they will basically do is they go in and generally dispute any, any negative item on the credit report. And the way the law is written now, if ABC Collections doesn't respond within 30 days saying that that collection account is correct and that's gonna stay on the credit, if they don't respond within 30 days, they have to delete that account in its entirety. And, and the credit repair companies, they send all these letters certified, excuse me. So the companies have to sign for them. And as soon as they sign for them, that clock starts right then and there. So after 30 days, if they don't respond, it comes off. So I've seen people with a 560 credit score, you know, four months later have a 710. It's amazing uh, that they can do that. It's, it's amazing that it's legal, uh, which it is because I did all the, the research on that. But um, so I look at every client as, hey, you might not be ready to go right now, but let's come up with a plan of attack. You know, in the military, in my unit, it was assess the damage, dress the wounds, and move out. And that's what I do with everybody. It's not, hey, come back to me when your life is perfect and you have great credit and plenty of money put down. So, yes? Do you know what the monthly fee is, just in general? I want to say it's, uh, last time I checked, I think it's $150. So it's not horrible when it comes to the cost because... If, if somebody was to wait and, you know, let time, you know, take its course to get the scores back up, that can take several years. So they have to realize, you know, whatever happened, happened. The credit is damaged. But yeah, there's a there's a there's a pay to play to get this done. They used to require that my clients did, signed up for a year membership. And then when I saw that they were starting to knock a lot of this stuff out between four and six months and I was sending in sending them that many clients, I said, I don't want them to have to do a year membership if you only need them you know, to be signed up for four to seven months. Once they qualify and I can take it from there and they can buy a home, cancel the membership. So they worked that out with me that they no longer charge a year membership. But I would say, generally speaking, it's $150 per person. So if a couple's doing, if a couple together are doing it, it's 300 bucks a month. But I always tell people, especially if they're younger, I'm like, you know, the credit score affects so many things. It affects, you know, what you're going to pay for your car insurance, for your homeowner's insurance. 
it, it's not just mortgages. It's going to affect your car payment. So if it's if it means you have to you know pay a little bit to get it fixed, then I always strongly suggest doing it. But you know I've had people and you know laughably I've I've talked to people that are eighty years old and they're like at this point what does it matter? You know I'm not going to own a home. I'm probably going to be here fifteen years and I don't need my credit score to go up. And I'm like well, you know you might have a point there. But um, so just just for the record, our bank we go down to a six six hundred credit score. So that's a, that's an FHA product. We do not have any products under 600. A lot of banks don't don't right now just because of the risk. Um, some some hard lenders do, hard money lenders do, but they have to put 20% down on a purchase price. And most people uh, that have a 620, or, or excuse me, most people that have a credit score below 600 generally don't have 20% put down on a property. So these are the things, <clears throat> the old pie chart, this is what, kind of drives the score in, in regards to the amount that the, the most important obviously is payment history. So if you're paying on time, paid as agreed, um, that's gonna be the biggest percentage of your credit score. Um, the amounts you owe is the next biggest. So basically I can take someone, if they have a $2,000 Discover credit card, like a $2,000 limit, and let's say their balance right now is $1,990. We have, a, we have a tool called What If, where I can have my assistant go in and he can adjust the numbers in the system that says, okay, Discover was a $2,000 credit limit. What if the balance was 500? And it gives us an automatic credit score update. If they pay it down to set amount, the score will go up 20 points or whatnot. So you can manipulate the scores, um, whether they pay something down, pay something off. And I can't tell you how many deals that saved over the years. So. Sometimes I'll say, you know, do you have a family member that might be able to help you out? You know, sometimes people don't realize they can take money out of their, you know, 401k to do this. It used to be that it had to be a hardship to take money out of your 401k. If you can show them that, hey, I need to pay these down to qualify to buy a home, a lot of them are, are allowing that to happen now. So there are, you know, and when I run someone's credit, for my, my assistant will send me the credit. The first thing I do is I call them. I tell them what their scores are. I go through each account on their credit reports. For example, I have a client right now. His name is Jeff Brown, super popular name. There's a judgment that shows up uh, for a bankruptcy three years ago. And I'm looking at everything else on his credit and it's immaculate. So I call him up and I'm like, hey, Mr. Brown, did you have a bankruptcy three years ago? Absolutely not, never. So then what we do is the, the title company will do a search for us and it comes back, hey, he was at this address. This was the social uh, social security number affiliated with that bankruptcy. That's not our guy. We get it removed off the credit. So I'll verify everything up front. Um, the length of the credit history, I see this a lot. And I saw one yesterday, as a matter of fact. So I had a client that had probably a 710 credit score about three months ago. And they weren't using these accounts at all. So they went ahead and just closed four accounts. Now their credit score is a 661. What happens is, if you delete an account or, or it says account closed at, con, at consumer's request, let's say that that credit card that they just closed, let's say they had it for three years and they never were late. That account shows paid as agreed for 36 months. And that helps the credit score based on, you know, if someone gets out of college and they have their first credit card and they've been making their payment for two months, they're not going to have a great credit score. But when you've had a length of credit history for a set amount, never been late, and you close that account, that immediately affects the credit score because you just lost a trade line that was paid as agreed. Um, now, if someone has like 15 accounts that they haven't used, I would say keep a few open, don't close them all, but that can affect uh, the credit the credit score, the, the history of the loan. So an account that's open for two months, that's not going to help a lot. <clears throat> now, new credit uh, is 10%. So when people say, you know, this is where if someone has a credit score of 600, and they go to get a credit card, nine out of 10 banks are not going to issue an approval just based on the credit score. So what I will do is I will give them a list of what's called secured credit cards. So basically you have to pay them $500. This is an example, $500 upfront, and they will give you a $250 credit limit. So they already know the money is in the bank. They can't lose because you had to pay up front. And then they will let you use that card and you just use it up to whatever amount you want and start making the payments on time. You can't go over 
usually half of the deposit. Um, so you, you open up a new account, it shows, hey, new account. Every month that goes by that you pay on time, it helps your credit score. And then once I've had clients that they got three secured credit cards right out of the gate, and then within six months, their scores went up 30, 40 points. Once you get to the, the score high enough, you can then, that bank then offers a non-secured credit card so they can move it from, hey, now your credit limit is 2000 because you showed us for the last year, you're good to go, you're making your payments on time. So that's a good way to establish new credit. Another tricky way or a, a way that I do a lot of times is if I have a younger person and their parents want to put them on as an authorized user to a credit card, they, and let's say their parent had that credit card for four years, never been late, all of a sudden it shows up on their credit as an authorized user. It shows up as four years, never been late. So it immediately increases the credit score, which we're okay with. Um, and then types of credit, you have basically two. You have installment, which is generally a mortgage and a car payment, and you have revolving. So the ones that hurt the most are the installment ones or what they call major credit lines, and that's the car payment and the mortgage. Um, if you go late on those, those are going to affect the credit score more than a hundred or a five hundred dollar Kohl's card. The the revolving credits don't affect the score as much. So I always tell them, if you're going to go late on anything and things get super tight. Just make sure it's not the mortgage or the cars. If it's going to be a credit card here and there until you get back on your feet, make sure you let the credit cards go a little bit late, but not the, not the car payments for the mortgage. <clears throat> so I'm not really running to this a whole lot, but we are we are now allowing a rental. A rental history can now show up on a credit report. It's called an alternative, alternative credit line. Um, so it, it, it depends on how they're set up as far as the landlord, but we can get a v, VOR, which is a verification of rent. And if it shows your rental history is perfect for 12 months with canceled checks or money order copies, we will apply that to the credit report. That way we can show one, a housing history, and it does, it, it does increase the credit score. Before we can do that, but we are now. So, and it really depends on how they're set up as the landlord. So I would keep that in mind if you have some people that are renting right now. So debt to income ratio. Debt to income ratio is basically your monthly bills divided by your monthly income. So there's two, two sides to the equation here. You have your housing expense, which is the mortgage. So you have principal interest, property taxes, homeowners insurance, insurance mortgage insurance, if that applies. Mortgage insurance is, is only applied if you're doing a conventional loan and you're not putting 20% down. If you're doing an FHA, an FHA loan, mortgage insurance stays on for the life of the loan. It never falls off. If you build 20 or 30 or 40% equity in, in the home, the mortgage insurance on FHA, FHA never leaves. Um, and then your, eight, your uh, HOA dues, um, we use it to qualify as part of the equation, but um, on some condos, it, it gets a little nutty in regards to what the HOA dues are a month. That's not a make it or break it for us in regards to qualifying based on the housing expense. So that's the, the first side of the, is the housing expense. And then you have non-housing debt, credit cards, car loans, uh, student loans, child support or alimony. This is big that as a lender, I see a lot of lenders screw up on this. And we actually have a form that we ask them on the application. And some are, for example, let's say there's a divorce and it's, it's not through the courts, but it shows up on a, on a paycheck stub as deferred to set account for alimony or child support. Just because it's not on a divorce decree, doesn't mean we have to count it against them. If it shows up on a pay stub and it automatically comes out because there are, there are certain states where the set, whatever spouse has to pay, as long as the kids are in college after the age of 18, they still have to pay as long as the, the child is in college. So I'm, I, I always look at every pay stub that comes in right out of the gate, but we clearly ask them at this time, are you obligated to pay child support or alimony? A lot of lenders screw that up. Um, and then let's say hypothetically, somebody has a judgment or a collection, usually the collection agency will work out a payment arrangement to say, hey, you owe 2000, we'll take a hundred bucks a month. Um, and we will, once, once you're paid off, we will delete the account or report it as a zero balance. So anything that shows up on the credit report as a judgment or collection, some, some medical collections we don't care about, but I always say it's in regards to a judgment. Um, if they're working out payment arrangements, we, we will include that into the non-housing debt. So here, the, the total scenario or equation is 
To qualify for a mortgage, you have to take the housing expense, which is what we're proposing based on whatever home they're trying to buy, plus the non-housing debt, car payments, credit cards, student loans, whatnot, equals your total debt. And we divide that by your gross monthly income. Um, so gross is basically before taxes, and that comes out to a certain percentage. And certain banks have certain numbers, you know, conventional uh, FHA and VA and USDA are all different. Um, so some banks are set, will say, we're not going to go above a 38% debt ratio in order to qualify this loan. Now, this is what, uh, this is important because back in the day, it used to be where, you know, there was actually a physical underwriter in the office that would look at the file and say yes or no. Essentially, 90% of my loans that I do, they are run through a system called AUS, which is Automated Underwriting System. It's a software. There's nobody I can talk to about it. It's either a yes or no. Now, every now and then, so you're either going to get an approve eligible, which is two thumbs up, or you're going to get a refer with caution uh, or a refer eligible. So the only one that is good is approve eligible. Now, sometimes I can take that to an actual underwriter and say, if we pay this down, if we pay this off, that's not theirs. Can we rerun it through the system? And if it, if it gives us an approved eligible, we sign off on it. Then they say yes or no. But essentially, in regards to the income, this is how they calculate whether someone's going to qualify or not. So when I see someone who, um, you know, they might, sorry about that. If I see someone who inherited a bunch of money from grandpa a couple of years ago, and, and all of a sudden they have this money and they want to buy a $500,000 house, that's not income that's going to recur every year. That's a one-time inheritance. And if they're not working, they're saying, why don't I qualify? Because that's not a job. You still have to qualify based on a, a, debt, a monthly debt ratio. Um, and then I see we have a question here on the bottom. Do we? Yeah. Um, Donovan wanted to know, can a client with a lower credit score still request manual underwriting? Yes. Yes. <laughs> so the example is gross, gross monthly income is 5,000. Proposed housing expense on the new house is 1248. Non-housing debt, car payments, credit cards, 875, and the total monthly debt is 2123. Proposed housing expense, 1248. Um, gross monthly income, 5,000. So basically, their housing debt ratio would be 25%. And then when you take the total monthly debt, which is 2123, divided by gross monthly income is 5,000. Their total debt ratio with housing and 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 the non-housing debt would be 42%. Now, what I was alluding to when it comes to AUS automated underwriting system. If you look in, you know, if you look at the guidelines for a conventional loan, most banks don't want to go above 43% because generally speaking, that's what, what Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac want is 43%. I just got one approved last week at 49%. And the reason it got approved at 49% is because they looked at everything. They looked at length of employment. They looked at credit score. They looked at how much they were putting down on the property. But the kicker that made it all work was, well, we look at the debt ratio, obviously, but the kicker that made it work is they had $150,000 in a 401k. So the way that it read this was if something completely hit the fan, they have $150,000 to stay afloat until, you know, they're back at work or they, they figure out the scenario they're in. So that asset that I put in there was the one that tipped the scale. Guidelines. So this, these are the debt ratios, like I was just talking about, 43% conventional. Now, FHA will actually go up to 50%, and I've seen it where they go up over 50%. So don't really pay attention to these. And I, I don't get stuck on these because it really depends on, like I said, credit score, length of employment, assets. VA, I just got one approved at 49%. Uh, USDA is usually 45% or less. Um, but I'll handle that part as long as the uh, as long as I have the, the correct income and then the home that they're trying to uh, trying to qualify for, I'll figure that out and figure out if they're good to go. And then sometimes I call back and say, hey, Mr. Smith, $300,000 is a little bit out of your range to get qualified. So if we're at 275, that would work. More times than not, they're like, okay, that's great. As long as I know what I'm qualified for and I'm not looking at the wrong houses, then I'm good to go. So in regards to the employment, Generally speaking, we would like someone to have a two-year job history with no gaps in employment. Being a full-time student counts, so if someone just graduated, as long as we have their transcripts, let's say they've been at their job for five months, uh, we have transcripts that are tied to the career that they're in right now. We'll look past that in regards to the two-year job history. Now, 
The ones that we don't want to see are the, the bouncers, the ones that three months here, four months here. Now they might collectively be two years together, but if they're not even tied to, the, if it's administrative assistant, fast food, you know, if they, if they aren't related at all, we can't use those. Um, but generally speaking, now if it's someone that it, who was at a temp agency, let's say they worked at a temp agency for a year, and now they just got hired on as a full-time employee, that won't work we, because temp does not count. That was a temp job. It, doesn't, it wasn't 40 hours a week. They want full-time, and full-time to the lender is 38 hours a week or more. So we want to make sure. This is the stuff that I'm really good at because I go through – it's called scrubbing a file. My assistant and myself, we will go through and we do the three things that are most important. Income, can they afford it? Credit, do they deserve it? And down payment, do they have it? And then we'll figure out the debt to income ratio. We'll look at the employment or the income. Yes. Oh, okay. Um, income should be stable or increasing. Now, we know we just got out of the, the 2020 year and some people haven't filed their 2021 taxes yet. 2020 is, is not going to reflect mostly for most people a good year so we take that in, in, into consideration we draw up a letter of explanation so we're going to look at 2021 and as long as the income continues to rise we're okay if all of a sudden someone made a hundred thousand dollars you know in 20 well, let's say let's say 2019 they made a hundred thousand dollars 2020 it was 50 because of COVID. as long as they're back to what they were making in 19 or even close we'll be okay um and then your income must be likely to continue for three plus years. I don't even pay attention to that because, you know, it used to be, you know, back in the day, people would, would, would generally have two jobs and then retire. You know, it, it, I saw the national average was when someone graduates from college till the time they, were, they retire, the national average is 17 jobs between graduation and retirement. So I don't really care about the three years continued plus and no employer in this day and age is going to say, we guarantee your employment for the next three years. Different now too than it used to be, you know. Oh, absolutely. Kind of accepted that it's Yep. So these are the acceptable sources um, in regards to like a down payment, um, checking savings, savings bonds, IRAs, four hundred one k, and just so you know, like if, if you want to, if your clients usually I say let me handle the numbers, but if they ask you, hey, I have money in a four hundred one k, a lot of the service servicers now will let you pull money out of the account. Um, to buy a home, and, and, it's, and it's not a hardship, and basically they will have you take out a loan. So if you need $20,000 out of your 401k, they'll set it up where you take out $20,000. They usually overnight or wire you the funds, and then they'll say, we'll take a payment of one fifty dollars a month to pay back your 401k. So we'll allow that $20,000 to be used, but we will count that one fifty dollars a month to pay it back in your debt-to-income ratio. But I've seen that save a ton. Um, stocks and bonds, thrift savings plans, gift funds from a relative. This is very important. So they, they're kind of bending the rules on this a little bit. So I have a client right now, they're not married, they're engaged, and they're allowing the dad of the, of the young lady to gift, gift funds. Um, they're not married, we're okay with that. I even had one where the stepdad was allowed to give gift funds. So it used to be back in the day, you have to show a direct relation by blood that that's your relative. And now they're, they're, they're kind of wiggling on a little bit because why would we care as a bank if someone's going to have $50,000 to put down on a house, whereas before they would have 5,000 as a bank that lessens our risk to lend. So they're kind of getting flexible on that. Uh, show, yeah, go ahead. Do you have to show where the funds come from? Great question. She said, do you have to show where the funds came from? Absolutely 100%. So part of the, the Dodd-Frank Act, which was passed in 2009 or 10, um, anything other than payroll greater than $500 has to be sourced. And it's kind of a dumb law where it's part of the anti-terrorism act. Like people, you know, ISIS is going to move money into your account and then you're going to move money back for ISIS. It, it, was, it, it wasn't really constructed the right way, but anything non-payroll greater than $500 has to be sourced. So I used to have clients back in the day, they didn't trust banks. They kept money at home. And I've had people that they got married and you know they get the envelope at the wedding reception and all of a sudden they have $10,000 in gifts from family and friends. Until that money is deposited and in an account for 60 days, we can't use those funds. So if you ever hear the term sourced and seasoned, 
sourced means where to come from and seasoned means it's got to be in the count for 60 days to be able to count it. So great I, I have a question, Will. Um, how are they look? Well, I know when we moved um, or when we got a, let's see, 2000, end of 2019, um, <clears throat> we were actually, um, we provided <laughs> Uh, our cryptocurrency as part of our um, payments. How are they looking at cryptocurrency now today? As long as it's like deposited, I can't remember if we had to deposit it into our account and how that all played out. And it's now it's like two years later. So do you know anything about how they're looking at electronic currencies? How long ago was that? Um, so we closed in September of 2019. But again, I cannot recall how they handle that. I know we, I know, um, I don't remember the specifics of if they, yeah, I know we ended up having like, I think we probably just had to like cash out on our crypto is probably we, what we ended up having to do. And then, but you know, with you saying it has to have been 60 days, I'm not sure if that's really what happened or not, <laughs> because then we wouldn't have waited 60 days. So to, if, you're, if your bank yeah. was going to accept cryptocurrency and then so went from crypto to actual funds in your bank account and sat there for 60 days, that would work. But that's okay. more lender specific because exactly. you have you have your what you have your conventional, your FHA, your VA guidelines. Lenders can have what they call lender overlays. So VA might say, we're going to go down to a 600 credit score based on their guidelines. Some lenders say, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to, we're going to say you have to be at a 650 to do a VA. So lenders can have their overlays on top of the actual guidelines, um, whether, right. whether it be VA conventional. So that would be lender specific if they're going to accept that. I thought so. And what I'll do um, is I'll follow up. I forgot to, I, you know, I wasn't even thinking about it. Um, I'll follow up with my husband and ask him how that played out and maybe um, run it by you next month um, okay. if you're going to be doing the meeting. So I would be interested. Yeah. Okay. So are you saying like um, when it comes to like crypto and Bitcoin and stuff like that, those things are lender specific? Yes, because oh. we we like my bank, we don't we don't accept those funds. Mm -hmm. Now, if they it, you know, it's just like when you have money here and you go to Europe, there's a conversion. Mm -hmm. So whatever the conversion be would be, I'm I'm not into crypto, so I'm not I'm not the expert on that, but whatever they decide to give as far as value for a cryptocurrency, and then you decide to move it into your checking or saving account, it might be, hey, it was worth you know, 10,000 here, we're going to give you six, you know, on this side, as long as it sits in the account for 60 days, Uncle Sam or us don't care where it came from, because it's going to show up as regular funds and had been there for 60 days. And then, what do you mean by sick? You're, we're going to give you 6,000 versus 10,000. So I'm, I'm just saying in regards to a conversion on cryptocurrency, I don't know if it's dollar for dollar, like the value. Oh, okay. Okay. So whatever the conversion might be, um, and, and like I said, our bank doesn't do it, so I'm not going to be the specialist on that. Now, that might be different a year from now based on what I'm seeing and reading. Well, I'm wondering, like, what do you think that'll be something that kind of is like a new thing in the future, possibly? I think it might be because I just saw where in Florida, the very first home was purchased with cryptocurrency this week. Completely. Completely. So I, I would say, you know, it's kind of exciting. I mean, I think it's, it, it might be a different, you know, I've, I've done this for 26 years. I've seen a lot of products change and I think it would be kind of cool if they did that. But literally this week in Florida, the first house was purchased with cryptocurrency. Um, I would state like on the sale or personal property, like let's say someone says, you know what, I'm going to sell this car that I've had in my garage forever. As long as there's a paper trail, like a bill of sale, they bought this for this, it was put in the account. Uh, and then it sat there. That does not have to season for 60 days, as long as you have a bill of sale. Now, if somebody pays you cash for that car in your garage, it's 60 days, it's gotta sit there. I, I don't do the, the collateralized stuff, I don't mess with grants. The only, like there are state grants, but a lot of those have been frozen right now. So I can't really say that that's an acceptable source, but the employer, the, the employer assistance plans, I haven't seen those in years. And then last, about, about two weeks ago, we, we changed our down payment assistance programs finally to make them attractive. And the reason they weren't attractive before was because we had a, we had a cap on the income that they could make to qualify for down payment assistance. So on the conventional product, there's still a cap on the income. 
on FHA, there is no cap. So if somebody, because how they're looking at it is, if you if you make one hundred twenty thousand dollars a year, and you have no debt, why do you have no down payment? So that's the conventional side. They'll cap you on the income. With FHA, you could make one hundred fifty thousand dollars a year and have no debt at all, and still qualify for the down payment assistance program. And I just closed one of those about two weeks ago. So that's an awesome product. Basically, how that's set up. I'll just go into this real quick since we're on it. Um, let, let's say FHA is three and a half percent down payment. Um, we have a we have a lender who's under our umbrella. It's called First Tribal Lending. It's actually um, it's a native bank. Um, we have affiliated with them a couple of years ago. They will lend or not lend. They will give a down payment assistance of three and a half percent. The rate's going to be higher because obviously there's no skin in the game on this loan. So basically, the first one, the first mortgage would, would be at ninety six and a half percent, and the second mortgage or down payment assistance would be at three and a half percent. If they stay in the home, this is where I beat a lot of lenders. They will waive the down payment assistance if the borrower stays in the home for 15 years. That's not likely. Our bank will, will, will uh, waive the down payment assistance if they stay in it five years. So it's an awesome product. I think that I think the rate was about a half a percent higher um, to qualify for that. But I just closed one under our new program a couple a couple weeks ago. So you'll hear this a lot. Am I pre-approved or am I, am I pre-qualified? Most banks aren't going to issue, like I have a, a template that I can draw up saying, hey, we verified income, assets, employment. We, we got the tax transcripts back. And the reason we don't want to give the pre-approval until the transcripts come back is because what, you, what someone might show you in a tax return might say they made, they made $150,000 last year, but what they show Uncle Sam might say 80. Um, and it happens more often than you think. So we always get the tax returns. We order the transcript, which is called a 4506. It, you, it can come back anywhere from three to four days. We verify what they filed with Uncle Sam is what we have in our returns. So I'm okay, bless you. I'm okay with um, doing a pre-approval. Now, most banks won't issue a full pre-approval until the appraisal is there. Why, you ask? The appraisal of the property is, that's, that's what's securing the mortgage. That's the collateral. So you know, they might say, based on your income, based on your assets, based on your credit, uh, based on your down payment, based on your employment, you're pre-approved. And some, lend some lenders or some listing agents will call me and say, well, I don't like the way this is worded because it says pre-qual versus pre-approval. To be honest with you, they're both worth the paper they're, they're written on. Until you get a full pre-approval from a bank, you don't have one. Now, I like to say I do everything. I do all the legwork up front, which is why I had no closings fallout, because it's, it's not rocket science. I mean, I'm a smart guy, but not that smart. So once you verify the four things and they're good, uh, unless they are lying, which never, doesn't really happen that much, the only thing that could screw it up is if they take out a new debt, which we make them sign a form that they're not going to do, uh, they don't have their credit run um, from the time we give the application or the, the pre-qual or the pre-approval, um, or they don't go late on something. Now, obviously, I had a, this was literally about three months ago. My clients call me, hey, are we good to go? Hey, are we good to go? Hey, are we good to go? Yep, we're good to go. We have your, uh, we have your pre-approval. We're just waiting on the verification of employment to come back, and then we can issue the full approval. Because we actually got an appraisal waiver on this purchase. There was no appraisal needed. And he called me way more often than most people do. And literally later that day, my client, my office calls me and says, he quit his job. So at the very last second, the lender is always going to do a verification of employment because, and he wasn't going to tell me. He, was, he wanted to close on that. And I called him back and, and said, did you, did you lose your job? He goes, no, I quit. I said, we can't do your purchase now. So the lender will always do that at the last second. Not that we don't trust anybody, but we don't trust anybody. I'm just kidding. Mm -hmm. um, so the, uh, but those are the only things that can screw it up. If, if, if I ever send you a prequel and the listing agent says, we have to have a pre-approval, I have a template where I can change it to make it look like what they want. But generally I just send out a prequel. So here's the, the prequel, like I said, we look at the credit, we look at the income, we look at the assets, we look at the debt ratio, that's a prequel. And then the pre-approval, like I was saying, income is verified, we have the transcript back from the IRS. Assets are verified. We have the bank statements. And then AUS or AUA, we have the automated system. Automated underwriting system has given us an approval. That's the only difference between the two. So I'm not going to get into this too much in regards to this. Um, 
everything, but, but basically one of the things that the most important thing is when I'm telling my clients, research your builder, but guess what? If they have a good representation uh, from a realtor, that's your job more or less to say, hey, let's, you know, I've done my research. It's a good builder or this builder, I would stay away, stay away from um, the HOA restrictions. I don't mess with that a whole lot. That's what you guys do. Um, the pre-approval, I do that. Um, on in, in what standard in regards to this is like from a builder, if you're going to do an upgrade uh, negotiation. What I generally do is if you say, hey, we need a pre-approval for 300. Um, I'm always careful about if you say, we'll just make it for 325. And if it's listed for you know a little under that, you don't want to give you don't want to show too many of your cards because if you're trying to negotiate between 300 and 325 and they see the pre-approval letter that says 325, they're thinking you're approved for 325 and they're going to accept probably nothing less than that. They don't want to allow you to meet in the middle. I've seen that too much lately. Um, home inspection stuff, I don't, I have companies that do it. I don't do any builder warranty. Um, and then is it in writing? Everything we do in regards to reading the contract, we'll do a scrub and read everything. And if we're missing something, we'll let you know, and then you can get it for us and come back. <clears throat> so make it official, schedule the inspection. That's the most, one of the most important pieces of the puzzle because um, if there's something wrong with the house, whether it be the foundation or the windows or whatever, uh, you'll want to know ASAP. We as the lender don't require an inspection. In this crazy world we live in right now, people are waiving inspections, which I don't even know how they do that, yeah. and sleep at night. The, the, you know what? I've, only, I've heard of two horror stories already from the time they waived the inspection, they waived the appraisal, um, and one of them came back and it's a, there's a foundation and a mold issue on the house. And le legally, you can't go back on the, on the seller for it because you waived the inspection. But I tell my clients all the time, and unless if the realtor tells me, you know, stay in your lane, don't talk to them about this, they don't want it. But if the client asks me, I'm like, would I ever buy a house without an inspection? Never, I would. Um, so formally apply for a mortgage, that's actually before the inspection. Um, what my assistant will do is throughout the process, we have we have a portal where we can actually go in that so the client doesn't have to keep sending in pay stubs and bank statements. He can verify it by just clicking on the button. So if your paycheck goes into your bank, he hits a little button, it goes right to Chase. It's called e-verify and it comes back and says, now this is what's in their account. So they don't have to stop and scan stuff or fax stuff. So we he does that, Aaron does that. Um, the, our application is all electronically signed. So it makes it super simple. For the clients that aren't really tech savvy, Aaron walks them through it and says, hey, why don't we just print this off? Um, we'll email it to you, you print it off, either bring it by the office or you can go, if you're comfortable, go to Staples um, uh, or Office Max and have them scan it back to us. That's in this day and age, we really don't see that. Usually a younger family member will help them sign it and then just electronically sign it back to us. But one of the cool things is at our closing, the day of the closing, they will get an email that morning that says, congratulations. They can open it up and they can electronically sign 95% of their closing documents for the closing later that day. So once they get to the closing, it speeds it up. And all we're, all we're waiting on is for the money. Now pay for the appraisal only after you're okay with inspection. But all the agents I work with, they, they do a great job of steering their clients in the right direction where that's a big issue or that's a non-issue or that's a little issue. Um, and then what Aaron, my assistant will do is he will contact, once, once the appraisal is done, the inspection is done, it's moving forward, he'll contact the homeowner's insurance agent and get the homeowner's insurance policy or a quote binder. Um, okay, so in regards to the, the insurance policy, a lot of clients, if you have a car, if you have car or multiple cars with your, um, with your agent, they have that bundle policy. I would always suggest going with the same agent. Um, they're going to give you a better price on it. Um, the, the Like I said, things that affect your premiums, your credit score, um, if they have prior claims on another property, then what I would always suggest is, you know, you might want to try a different agent. You know, a lot of times, and all the information is public records, so they'll be able to see it. But I don't really touch base um, on the insurance. But what I will say is this, you have to pay, generally all lenders, on the homeowner's insurance policy, it, let's say you're closing on Friday of this week. By Friday, you have to be able to show you're going to pay 
14 months of homeowner's insurance because you have to pay for one year in advance and most lenders want a two year or two month cushion on the premium paid up front. And the reason this happened is in, in Pennsylvania, I forget what year, this is why it all changed it. Somebody, agents used to accept insurance monthly payments. So you close on your house, you pay your first month's insurance, let's say it's a hundred bucks. And then the next month is a hundred bucks. They would allow you to pay monthly. The, after the first month was paid, their house was hit by lightning and it burned down to the ground. That insurance company had to rebuild that house for roughly a hundred dollars. So they changed that immediately, understandably. So, but you know, that's the stuff like if you have your insurance agent, now what we will do is if we, if we see that, that your client has great credit and if we see every now and then we, could, we keep them honest. And if I see someone's buying a $300,000 house and the premium is $4,000 a year, we know by looking at a scale we have that that seems very excessive. So we'll call that client and say, have you shopped around in regards to this? Not to say that, well, that's my agent. He's been my agent for years. Have you had any, 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 uh, have you had any, uh, pre or any claims in the past five years? No, none. I'm like, and it's $4,000, you know, a year. That seems a lot more times than not, they'll shop around or they'll call their agent back. Their agent gets irritated and then they'll call around and it's half of what the agent was going to charge. So that doesn't happen a lot, but we always watch those numbers. So once the file goes into underwriting, um, like I said, right away, we have the AUS, the automated underwriting system that says approve, approve eligible, good to go. We're knocking out everything, the appraisal, the inspection, we're ordering title uh, on the property. We order title to make sure there's no liens or judgments on the title that your clients get ready to buy. Once the title goes in, once the insurance goes in, the homeowners, um, once the funds have been verified for the down payment, then it goes into underwriting. And generally speaking, once that all goes in, we're at 24 to 48 hours for clear to post. Once that happens, we call the client, guess what, you're clear to post, they're all excited. Um, and then um, you can schedule the closing. Once the, so here's the three day rule, you'll hear this. Um, you have to, back in the day, you used to be able to get a clear to close and close that same day or the next day or whatever. Now there's a three day rule. So hypothetically, if they get the disclosures on Monday, you cannot close. The day you send the disclosure does not count. So you have to give them Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday between, that's the three days, the earliest they can close is Friday of that week. And the reason they do that is because there were some companies where it was the old, hurry up and sign this, hurry up and sign this. I will close this tomorrow, no worries. And then the client didn't have time to review everything at their own pace. And it was kind of a hush, you know, hush rush. Um, now there's a three-day rule. So if they say, has the CD gone out? That's what they're talking about, the closing disclosure. And then the day of, you're gonna take your clients, they're all excited, get the clear to close. Um, you do the final walkthrough, hey, everything looks great. You know, and then at the closing, they give you the garage door openers, but that's your final walkthrough to make sure since they've moved out, nothing's wrong with the property uh, and you're good to go. So on the, in, if it's, if it's under $10,000 and your client, if they're bringing under $10,000 for their cash to close, that can be uh, a cashier's check or a money order. If it is over $10,000, it has to be wired from their bank to the title company. So just remember $10,000 is the lucky number. And then boom, closing day. Um, With funds that large, how does the um, bank transfer, bank wire charge, those people who have this cash, or does it take like a So generally she asked how long a wire would take. Um, I've seen, you know, most banks are, you know, the, the bigger banks, um, the, the smaller banks say, I always tell my clients, wire the funds two days before closing. That way there's no at the last minute we don't have the wire so but most of them if i go into the bank at like when i closed on my house i went to chase i think i was in there at 9 30 and by 10 15 the title company had the wire so it's usually within an hour or so but if it's a smaller bank and they're like you know we need this we need this but you know for reference if we but we tell them that as a lender we coach them and say okay guess what your closings next Monday, I would suggest you have the money to the title company no later than Thursday. That way you're never waiting on the funds. And then I think I have some questions here. Let me double check. So is this not, this presentation is not being shared? Oh, you mean later, Cynthia? 
Yes, later. Yeah, uh, Michelle's going to put it on the uh, KW Facebook page. Thank you. Yep. So that's essentially what I have. Does anybody have any questions they want to fire at me? I, I try and cover as many things as I can, but um, anything anybody want to ask or go over? Keegan, I have a question. I have a seller getting ready to put their home on the market, and I did a walkthrough and I noticed peeling paint in one window had a crack in it. How should I advise him as far as buyers coming in with a FHA or a VA loan or a USDA loan? I'm so, just worried about the appraisal. Yeah, so the, the, the paint chips is more of a VA issue. For some reason, they just have this issue with paint chips. Um, it really depends on the appraiser. So some of them, now, if it's a, like a big crack in the window, it's hard to really guide you until you see it. Um, it. It really depends. One, is it gonna show up on the inspection that the buyers order? If they do an inspection and it shows up, that's gonna be addressed at some point. So either seller, the seller is gonna say, we're gonna fix that or we're not gonna fix it. But it really depends on the, the severity of it. And I've seen like, like a, FHA doesn't like paint chips either. FHA doesn't like old windows. Uh, where there's not a good seal, but you can take five appraisers and put them on the same house and they're, they're going to come up with five, five different appraisals. So it really depend, depends on the severity. Have you seen it? Um, yes, I have. Just one window pane had a crack and then there was peeling paint in several areas around so, that, so. In, until you know what the buyer, what mortgage the buyer is going to do. I mean, if it's conventional, what I can tell you is this. If they were going to go conventional, neither of those things would matter unless the appraiser brought it up and it's called deferred maintenance. If he's saying, I'm going to take, you know, $500 off the value of this appraisal for this damage that's done in this window. And in, unless if we don't see it, we don't know about it. But if they if they bring it up or mention it, um, what I always tell clients is like, look, if you have to pay someone or you do it yourself, scrape the paint and paint it. That way it's a non-issue. The window, it really depends on what the inspector or the appraiser says. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So like I was saying, if you guys have any questions, my information's on there. Um, I'm always available. I'm, I'm super quick to respond. Unless I'm in a closing, even when I'm in a closing, I can still text. So I would say call, text me, or email me if you have any questions. Um, just like my favorite borrowers to this day are still first-time home buyers, newer agents, uh, are going to have more questions and that's okay because someday when you, at one point you were new and at some point you're going to be a rock star and I want to I want to be with you from the beginning to the rock star phase then you have to give me all your clients so you know it works for me but um, I appreciate you guys spending some time with me this morning and if you need anything just reach out thank you very much have a great day thank you So right before I come here, I tell my assistant, hey, I'm going to be unavailable for an hour at uh -huh. KW. Um, so if you need me, call me.